So um, I'm Richard Ayler and it's my pleasure to uh, talk today about diabetic foot complications. You can all agree with this. This is uh, a condition we see so often in our medical practice as infectious disease specialists. However, what we often encounter is the end result. We encounter the patients who are, have serious complications of diabetic foot conditions, um, including uh, osteomyelitis and, amputate, and even that go on to amputation in some cases. The purpose of this talk is to discuss the assessment and management of diabetic foot infections. So hopefully we can prevent those end complications. So uh, many of you who are jazz fans remember uh, Ella Fitzgerald. She was uh, one of the, um, the principal jazz artists of the 20th century. She went by the name of Lady Ella, the first lady of song. And um, in fact, she was a, a, medal, of, a, a medal of Honor recipient uh, uh, in uh, the 1980s by uh, George Bush 41. When she was asked in 1993 what factors had led to her diabetes related related leg amputations, she said, I simply liked pointy-toed shoes. And I think that this is uh, emblematic of some of the challenges that we face in getting patients to change their behavior when they have uh, type 2 diabetes. And she's not the only celebrity or, or uh, person of prominence who has been aff afflicted by type 2 diabetes. All of these people had type 2 diabetes. Uh, Thomas Edison, when he was in between perfecting the incandescent light bulb. He had to deal with diabetes. But Tom Hanks, uh, Randy Jackson, Paula Dean, the first lady of Southern cooking, as I like to call her. George Lucas, the first uh, gentleman of Star Wars. And uh, James Earl Jones, the uh, voice of CNN, uh, among other things. Uh, and Billie Jean King, who just had a movie made about her, uh, Battle of the Sexes. I don't know who saw that. But all these people uh, had type 2 diabetes. Yes, and B.B. King as well. Um, so where are we in uh, 2018 to 2019? I wish we were somewhere with updated guidelines, but we are not. Uh, Dr. Tony knows the last uh, diabetic foot infection guidelines released by um, IDSA were, were uh, published in 2012. But some of our therapies have changed. Uh, so we have some new therapeutic options. Others are, no, are not as uh, emphasized. Obviously, the goal is still primary and secondary prevention. Prevention of the diabetic foot ulcer and then prevention of recurrent ulceration when it, when, uh, in patients who, have been, who, who we treat and heal. And our ultimate goal is still to reduce amputations. So um, I always like to put this slide up when I talk about diabetic foot infections uh, because a lot of times we get uh, consulted and uh, you know, our, we're, set, we're uh, expected to heal this patient who has a diabetic foot complication. You know, Dr. Ayler, please treat my patient who has diabetic foot osteomyelitis, uh, make them better. But we shouldn't feel like we're in it alone. As a matter of fact, um, there's a whole team that's involved in carrying the diabetic foot from people that we, we would expect like um, uh, like uh, podiatrists to orthopedists to vascular surgeons. Um, but look at some of these other team members from endocrinology to the primary care ND to the pharmacist who uh, helps us to prescribe appropriate uh, medications for management of diabetes and management of complications. As a matter of fact, there are more than 20 specialties represented here. So think about this as a team approach because it really is. So about 10% of the US population has diabetes. That's a profound number of people. It's over 30 million. Uh, each year, uh, anywhere from one to 6% will develop a foot ulcer. The lifetime risk is about uh, one in four. And um, uh, once a patient, a diabetic patient develops a foot ulcer, up to a quarter will require amputation. That's a lot of amputations. This uh, exacts a tremendous effect on uh, uh, on uh, uh, public and private payers, estimated to be from nine to $13 billion annually. And diabetes is not going away. Uh, it's been estimated that uh, by 2050, uh, one in three US citizens will have diabetes. Think about that. One in three people will have diabetes in their lifetime. 
if current trends continue. This is obviously a trend line that we want to reverse. Now, diabetic foot ulcers uh, place a considerable financial burden on both uh, the diabetic patient and society. Um, this is from uh, an article published in 2014. Rice and colleagues looked at more than 32,000 patients with type 1 or type 2 diabetes and calculated uh, annual incremental health care costs of between uh, 12 and $17,000 uh, per patient with a diabetic foot ulcer. And uh, there's over $3,000 estimated in annual work loss costs. So um, what are some risk factors for, for the formation of a diabetic foot ulcer? Well, uh, the first three here are different types of neuropathy. So neuropathy places, a, it, it, it uh, produces a significant burden on a patient leading to foot ulceration in several different ways. Let's think about uh, what peripheral motor neuropathy does to the diabetic foot uh, patient. So peripheral uh, motor neuropathy um, causes irregularities in muscle function in the foot. This can alter foot anatomy and biomechanics, um, can lead to things like uh, hammer or claw toes, of subluxed uh, metatarsophalangeal joints. This can uh, lead to the formation of a callus, which is the earliest step in the formation of a diabetic ulcer. Sensory neuropathy causes an insensate foot. Insensate feet can't function properly because you don't get that feedback that each of us get when we place our feet, our feet on the ground in the, in the course of walking. Autonomic neuropathy um, messes up uh, our, our uh, autonomic mechanisms like perspiration and sweating. It can lead to dry, cracking skin. Um, narrow osteoarthropathic deformities like Charcot foot, which we'll talk more about, can alter foot anatomy and lead to excess pressure, leading to ulcer. Vascular insufficiency uh, prevents uh, wound healing and impairs tissue. Uh, hyperglycemia is an impediment to proper immune system function and can also <coughs> affect wound healing. Let's not, uh, affect, let's not forget about maladaptive patient behaviors like uh, failing to inspect your feet, wearing improper footwear, and so forth. And uh, we in the healthcare system, we also are to blame as well. When we don't educate our patients about their feet, and when we uh, fail to educate them on the monitoring of, of uh, their diabetic uh, blood sugar control. So I always like to put this uh, slide up to um, remind us of, of what amputation was in, in, the, in the period of yesteryear. This is a uh, plate representing uh, foot amputation in the uh, 19th century. Um, you can see the surgeon there on the bottom right. Uh, you know, he, we, we might assert today that his infection control is somewhat questionable. And uh, at his disposal are uh, three strong men, a hacksaw blade, and a bucket. Um, now, in many cases, the only anesthetic that uh, a patient was provided at the time was uh, maybe a swig of a, a couple swigs of alcohol, some liquor. And, uh, and, and then was held down by these uh, three strong orderlies. Uh, can you imagine what that must have been like? You know, many patients uh, died in the, of the shock and trauma of the procedure even before it was done. So I always like to invoke uh, the thoughts of uh, the great uh, 19th, surgery, 19th century surgeon and anatomist, Sir Astley Paston Cooper, for whom uh, Cooper's ligament and Cooper's fascia uh, was named who wrote, he is a good surgeon who can amputate, but he is a better surgeon who can spare a limb. So we can be our own surgeons uh, in, in the fact we can save a limb. We can do better than uh, what a surgeon can do. And we can preserve a uh, patient's limb by avoiding amputation. And we all need to, uh, to certainly look at that approach uh, whenever we can. Unfortunately, amputations are far too common, and it's been estimated worldwide that an amputation secondary to diabetes occurs every 30 seconds. In uh, the USA, the latest uh, uh, data that I was able to find was from 2014. There were some 108,000 amputations per year. By the way, that's an amputation every five seconds. 
it's actually much more common. And uh, there are higher rates in men and racial and ethnic minorities. Amputations are extremely profoundly expensive. It's es estimated up to $60,000 per amputation. And that amounts to uh, two billion a year or more in total costs. Now, a lower limb amputation extracts a heavy physical toll on the diabetic patient because limb resection increases the metabolic worse work excuse me, necessary for ambulation while decreasing the efficiency of movement. Now this can severely tax a diabetic patient who already has other comorbidities, cardiovascular, maybe pulmonary comorbidities, and, um, and, and, and uh, their overall efficiency of movement is decreased. Um, and for this reason, I think we can reflect upon these sobering statistics. Um, the five-year mortality rate of any amputation can be anywhere from 53 to 100%. So if you're a diabetic patient and you get an amputation, your five-year mortality rate can be up to 100%. And it doesn't really matter all that much whether you have an AKA or a BKA when you look at the overall statistics. Um, and risk factors for increased mortality can be age, particularly renal disease. We see a lot of patients who have um, end-stage renal disease, diabetes, and they get an amputation, proximal amputation to a certain extent, and peripheral vascular disease. Now this is from uh, the International Best Practice Guidelines. Look at the um, five-year mortality for diabetic foot-associated complications in the context of several other cancers. So we're looking at neuropathic DFU, diabetic foot ulcer, amputation, ischemic diabetic foot ulcer, and peripheral arterial disease. The five-year mortality is actually worse than some other cancers, such as prostate cancer, breast cancer, Hodgkin's lymphoma, and colon cancer. So if you have a diabetic uh, foot amputation or diabetic foot complication, your five-year mortality is worse than if you had some cancers. That's pretty sobering to consider. So how do diabetic foot ulcers and amputation occur more specifically? Well, in many cases, it's the triad of neuropathy, ischemia, and infection. When you put those together, it progresses to amputation. So how does that occur? Let's look at it a little more closely. So sensory neuropathy decreases protective sensation. That can increase foot pressure and uh, reduce the recognition of minor trauma. That's where the callus forms. And then when you combine that with uh, decreased joint morbidity, uh, mobility rather, and motor neuropathy, that can uh, cause muscle atrophy and increase foot pressure over bony prominences, places like underneath the first MTP joint. If you think about it, we see a lot of ulcers over the under in the plantar surface of the first MTP joint. Um, that can lead to the development of a pre-ulcer, which in the presence of minor trauma can be mechanical, chemical, or thermal, can lead to the development of an ulcer. It's, uh, autonomic neuropathy also is a um, condition potentiator because it can uh, lead to more cracking dry skin and can reduce the pliability of the soft tissues. Ischemia um, isn't as much of a factor in the formation of an ulcer in it, it, as it is in reduction in the ability of wounds to heal. And uh, when infection occurs as a result after an ulcer forms, it's an immediate precursor in many cases, and we know this intuitively, to amputation. Now, the day-to-day -day quality of life for many diabetic limb amputees can be profoundly affected by amputation. So let's think about this. Many individuals regard amputation as a devastating occurrence. Um, there's a potential for long-term physiologic and psychosocial effects. Their day-to-day -day activities of daily living can be significantly affected if they have an amputation. It can impair their physical activity. It may lead to depression. Let's, let's say you're uh, a diabetic patient and you like to play golf and you get an amputation. Your, your friend circle at the golf club is going to be profoundly affected. You can't play golf anymore. You lose your social contacts. There may be the potential for decreased income. You may be forced into early retirement. And um, all these things can profoundly affect 
someone with an amputation. So um, let's talk about diabetic neuropathy more significantly. Um, how does this process occur? Well, let's think about it. So you have uh, the presence of motor neuropathy in your foot, right? And that causes an imbalance in certain muscle groups in the foot, particularly your, inter your interosseous muscles. What that will do is cause the, um, the MTP joints to be thrust down and the, the interphalangeal joints to be thrust up. That produces a, what's known as a hammer toe. So you have an imbalance of pressure in the foot that leads to breakdown under the first MTP joint, thinning of the soft tissues. And then after the th soft tissues are thin, we know this intuitively, it's very easy for bacterial infection to occur here, forming an diabe infected diabetic ulcer. And once the soft tissues are infected, the bone follows and that leads to osteomyelitis and ultimately can lead to amputation. So how do we classify diabetic foot wounds? There's a variety of different systems. Um, when I first gave this talk about uh, 18 years ago, I talked a lot about the Wagner system. That was the initial one that uh, has been established uh, since the early 1980s. But uh, the Wagner system, which some of you may have heard of, doesn't fully address infection and ischemia. And, uh, and so for that reason, um, other classification systems became adopted, including the University of Texas uh, classification system, um, the PETIS classification system, and there's another one called Sinbad. So um, Wagner grading system uses a series of, of uh, grades from zero to five. Grade zero is no ulcer. Uh, grade one is a superficial ulcer. Grades two and three are deep ulcers, progressing from no bony involvement to bony involvement, and grades four and five involve localized or extensive gangrene. So this is an example of a Wagner grade one on the top, and then a Wagner grade two involving just the uh, soft tissues, a Wagner grade three, a much more significant ulcer. Um, now the University of Texas classification sheds the uh, later two grades and adds stages. The stages involves whether or not there's infection, ischemia, or a combination of those both. So uh, Wagner, the Wagner system, which by the way is the first diabetic ulcer assessment tool to receive validation, uh, can, pro can uh, progress from a, sta a, a grade zero stage A, which is basically a Epi completely epithelialized um, pre or post ulcerative lesion to a grade three stage D, which is a, the worst stage. It's a penetrating wound with infection and ischemia, usually the severest form of osteomyelitis. Um, now, this is the PETIS classification system. In the interest of time, I won't get, go into it, but this is widely, appears widely online. And, uh, and you can, you can uh, uh, find that just by doing an internet search. So different classification systems. So how many of you have heard of the Charcot foot? I'm sure most of you had. So how do, how do Charcot arthropathies occur? Well, um, autonomic nerve dysfunction in the foot um, basically increases blood supply and that causes accelerated reabsorption of bone. Um, meanwhile, the patients progress in their sensory neuropathy and that causes a loss of the ability to perceive the damage that you're doing to your foot with ambulation. Have you all uh, um, missed a step and then planted your foot down and felt that pain, that burning? Well, diabetic patients don't feel that when they, ex when they ambulate excessively and that can cause uh, gradual destruction and stress fractures to form as we see here on the right. These are stress fractures. Over time, that can cause destruction of the, particularly the proximal foot and also the, the ankle. And uh, this is the advanced Charcot foot. We can see that here. It looks kind of like a mallet. And uh, the acute Charcot foot can be, appear warm, swollen, and red. It can really mimic osteomyelitis can be very dif difficult to differentiate osteomyelitis. Particularly, it can dif be difficult to differen differentiate people with Charcot changes who may also have osteoarthritis. So these are among the more most difficult of the diabetic feet to assess. 
And these, but, but patients with pure Charcot changes, they don't need antibiotics. What they need is offloading. They, they can offload by staying off their foot, um, bed rest or, a, or a, a non, another non-weight bearing device like a contact cast, for example. So I'm gonna proceed forward here and talk about the diabetic foot exam. The diabetic foot exam is an essential component of preventing diabetic foot complications. It should be done annually if possible, and it can be done in as little as three minutes. So um, what does the three-minute diabetic foot exam compose of? It, compo it composes one minute of asking, one minute of examining, and one minute of teaching. Okay, so what are the things you ask about? So you take a history. You ask the patient, do they have a history of a previous leg or foot ulcer or a lower limb amputation or surgery? Now, obviously, if somebody has a BK, you're gonna notice that, but we're talking about if they have a sort of peripheral amputation, like the amputation of a digit. Have they ever had any vascular procedures? Have they had a foot wound that requires more than three weeks to heal? Do they smoke? Do they use nicotine products? Do they vape? Um, have they, do they have diabetes, for instance? Now, does the patient have any of these symptoms? Burning or tingling, leg or foot pain, changes of skin or color, loss of lower limb extremity sensation? And have they established regular podiatric care? Here at the James A. Haley Veterans Hospital, we have an excellent and a very um, active podiatric support among our patients. What do we look for? Well, we do a dermatologic exam looking for things like evidence of fungal infection, discolored or hypertrophic skin lesions, intradigital maceration. We do a neurologic examination, um, particularly utilizing, checking for in, insensate foot. I'll cover that in just a second. We do a musculoskeletal exam. Do the patient have obvious deformities? Do they have uh, a hot red and inflamed midfoot, as may be seen in a Charcot joint? We also look at uh, uh, changes that can be consistent with uh, vascular ischemia. Uh, we'll talk about that more in a second. What do we teach? Well, we teach recommendations for daily foot care. We educate regarding shoes. A lot of our patients are poorly compliant with diabetic footwear. And we talk about overall health risk management, like smoking cessation and keeping your diabetes under control. Now, as far as screening for neuropathy, there are two approaches. The most practical uh, uh, in previous years have been the SEMS-Weinstein monofilament test. How many of you have heard of that? How many of you have a monofilament device? Most people do. And as you know then, this is the application of a special 5.07 monofilament line to several areas of the foot. Um, you then uh, tell, ask the patient whether they feel the monofilament as well. Uh, a, um, a feature of the monofilament line that you want to be cognizant of. If you use it too much in a patient, you need to give it a little bit of a rest because it tends to become uh, a little more pliable and it may be less sensitive. And for the longest time, this has been a, uh, a common approach to check a patient for neuropathy with the sems weinstein monofilament test. Now, in recent years, a second modality called the Ipswich Touch Test has been released. How many of you are familiar with the Ipswich Touch Test? So the, the ITT utilizes another tool that all of us have with us at all times, it's namely our finger. How many people have your fingers with you right now? Okay, I see 100%. <laughs> Dr. Tony's missing one there. And uh, so for the uh, ITT, utilize um, firm but uh, consistent pressure on the first, third, and fifth toe tips, asking the patient whether they feel those as well. So you check six different toes, right? Assuming they have both of their feet. And uh, the ability of the patient to perceive this um, is associated with um, protective sensation. And in a head-to-head -head trial published in 2014, both methods were comparable to detecting the loss of pressure sensation. So you don't have to not check for an insensate foot just because you don't have your monofilament. If you have your index finger, you can do the same. Now, unfortunately, we're not doing a good enough job in diabetic foot exams. This data is a little bit old, it's from 2005, but as you can see, here in the VA, we're doing better than most, but in most practice environments, 
One third of all patients have not had a uh, regular annual diabetic foot exam. Only two thirds have been examined. And that's an area that we as healthcare providers can greatly improve. I'm going to move on to diabetic vascular disease. And there's no disagreement about the impact of vascular disease on the diabetic patient. Atherosclerosis occurs much earlier in diabetic patients and progresses more rapidly than in a non-diabetic patient. The relative risk of atherosclerotic complications is substantially higher for heart disease, um, cerebral vascular disease, and peripheral arterial disease. Um, this patient, unfortunately, is probably going to go on. They can't be revascularized to, uh, to get require an amputation. And what's more frustrating uh, uh, about diabetic vascular disease, as all of us know intuitively, is that a lot of diabetic vascular disease is microvascular, right? And that's much more harder to, to revascularize surgically. Now, risk factors for uh, diabetic peripheral vascular disease I've listed here. And the ones in red are non-reversible, right? So you can't reverse your genetic predisposition. You can't reverse your age except people like Dr. Tony, who's ageless. And um, the duration of diabetes is something we certainly can't change. But the rest of these factors in white are reversible. So um, we can actually do a lot to reverse uh, risk factors for diabetic vascular disease in our patients. And I put a frown face next to smoking because smoking is perhaps the most egregious of all these, right? Um, not only is smoking atherogenic, but it also increases blood viscosity, um, it uh, induces arterial vasoconstriction, and it induces clotting factors. So smoking is uh, definitely the gasoline that you can pour on the flame of diabetic vascular complications. Now, uh, this is one of my uh, uh, diabetic patients who had already had an amputation from uh, past years, and uh, he has many of the signs of uh, diabetic peripheral vascular disease. By the way, these uh, ulcers on the top of his foot were not due to his diabetes. He dropped a lit cigarette on his foot. So um, this was a teaching moment for me to tell him that smoking was bad for him uh, in many ways. But uh, um, many patients with diabetic uh, peripheral vascular disease start out by having cold feet, right? Cold feet is a, a common uh, presenting symptom. Claudication actually was originally a um, veterinary term applied to horses with peripheral arterial disease. It means to limp. And uh, intermittent claudication is a uh, common complaint among our patients. These, these patients complain of, uh, of pain in their feet with ambulation, and uh, intermittent claudication is alleviated uh, with rest. Um, and uh, intermittent claudication may progress to nocturnal pain. Nocturnal pain is particularly difficult for, vi for diabetic patient, foot patients because um, it will interrupt their sleep. They'll be very frustrated that they can't get sleep due to their aching legs or feet. A lot of times they'll uh, jump out of bed, hop up and down, drape their feet over the edge of the bed and so forth. Um, rest pain is particularly uh, onerous for patients too. And uh, um, you know it's bad enough to have pain when we walk, but it's worse to have rest pain. Um, and um, rest pain and uh, nocturnal pain are both indications for revascularization, so we need to be on the lookout for those. So um, looking at this patient, again, you see some of the shiny, atrophic, very cool appearing skin um, in a patient like this. If I were to palpate his dorsalis pedis or posterior tibial pulse, I would not feel the pulses. He also has some dependent rubor. You know, you ask a patient to drape their foot over the examining table or in their wheelchair, and they have this sort of uh, very um, vague kind of mild redness. He also has absent hair, and he has onychomycosis. When you see onychomycosis in a diabetic patient, again, this is oftentimes a sign of poor diabetic control and hyperglycemia, right? Because fungi like a uh, sort of a hypoaerophilic environment and, uh, uh, and, and hyperglycemia. Now there are uh, many different ways to evaluate uh, diabetic peripheral vascular disease. We know intuitively the most common are uh, NIVs, the presence uh, checking for arterial waveforms and for segmental pressures. Segmental pressure checking includes uh, formal ABI testing, right? And if the rule of thumb is if you have an arterial brachial index, 
that's less than 0.9, that's, a, that's associated with uh, peripheral arterial disease. We also want to look on the NIVS report for toe pressures, right? So toe pressures are important because the presence of a toe pressure of less than 30 millimeters of mercury is associated with ischemic complications. Contrast arterio ter ar arteriography or the arteriogram is still the gold standard of diagnosis. Although sometimes we hear about other modalities like MRA, multi-detector CT, and uh, sometimes you'll see reports that um, talk about transcutaneous O2 measurement. So how do you get an A, how do you do an ABI? How many people know this? So you put cuffs on both the upper and lower extremities and you check for a blood pressure utilizing your Doppler tool. And let's say if you're gonna measure the right ABI, that's the higher of the two right ankle pressures, either posterior tibial or dorsalis pedis, um, divided by either the higher of the two arm pressures. And then you come up with a fraction, and that fraction is your ABI. So normal is anywhere from 0.91 to 1.3. And if you have moderate, mild obstruction, that's uh, 0.71 to 0.9. Moderate is uh, anything above 0.41 to 0.70. The definition of Severe obstruction is less than 0.4 with your ABI, but anything less than 0.5 is associated with poor ulcer healing. Some of our patients will come back with an extraordinarily high ABI. What does that mean? Calcification. That's calcifications, right? Non-compressibility. I went to a, um, a, a ultrasound class that they have here. We're trying to get for you guys for the fellows for diagnostic ultrasound, and I actually got to see how they compress vessels in the leg. You put your ultrasound along the, uh, the, femoral, arter the uh, uh, femoral artery vein complex, and you press down, and you can see the, the vessels compress. Um, but if there's calcification, the vessels don't compress. So those individuals need um, a different type of modality to, to determine their vascular uh, status. Now, um, all is not lost when someone is diagnosed with diabetic peripheral vascular disease because there's actually a lot that you can do medically for these patients. The two most important modalities are smoking cessation and um, a graded exercise program like leg exercises or wa even walking. But emphasizing good diabetic foot care optimizing diabetic control, treating hyperlipidemia, and even considering antithrombotic therapy in these patients are all medical interventions before surgery. And periodic vascular lab reassessment is also important because these patients can progress and where they may be in the mild category, after a few years they may progress to something more, especially if their medical management is not emphasized. What are the absolute indications for taking your patient to surgery. Intractable disabling nocturnal or rest pain, a non-healing ischemic ulcer or the presence of ischemic or infectious gangrene are all absolute indications, but some other factors to consider include patient comorbidities, risk factors for surgery, and really whether the patient is likely to benefit from the procedure. You always need to consider those things because a patient with absolute indications who's not a good candidate for surgery, in the, in the end, the outcome may not be what you desire. Now, uh, I don't know if, if um, many of you have heard about the concept of biomechanical factors, but the biomechanic, biomechanics of diabetic feet are the structural and physiologic factors that lead to foot ulceration. So when you see someone with a dorsal ulcer on their feet, that's not an insensate foot necessarily, that's poorly fitting footwear, right? See a lot of patients who come in with dorsal ulcers, they're, they're wearing pointy toes or they're wearing shoes with tight foot boxes, they're not wearing diabetic feet, so think about that. Also, structural alterations on the plantar surface that can cause ulcers, charco changes, hammer toes, even prior amputation that alters their walking patterns. Um, but we also want to think about things like strength loss um, and abnormal posture and gait. These are all hopefully things we can intervene in.
Now think about it. The majority of ulcers on the force forefoot occur in a limited number of areas, right? Most of the ones we see are either under the first or second metatarsophalangeal joints or at the tip of the third toe. So these are areas for intervention where we can pr hopefully prevent ulcers. Now once biomechanical factors induce alter ulceration, infection becomes the single most significant factor leading to the development of gangrene and amputation. That's where we come in, right, as infectious disease specialists. And we know intuitively that infection response in the diabetic is affected because of things like um, ischemia and also hyperglycemia. Hyperglycemia is an immunomodulator. It, it reduces our ability in the diabetic patient to respond to infection. And a lot of times we get uh, cultures that come to us and they're superficial cultures, they grow odd organisms, are those really significant where we really need to apply our discretion to whether that, um, that Klebsiella or that uh, Acinetobacter from a superficial culture really is the pathogen that, cause, that is causing the underlying infection. It's also important to um, define the extent of the infection. Is this a superficial infection or is there a sinus tract going deep down to the bone that needs further exploration. Now when we talk about pathogens associated with the diabetic foot, let's think about some different categories. If we have a patient with cellulitis without an open skin wound, this is from the 2004 diabetic foot guidelines, we want to think about staph and strep, right? Those are the main skin pathogens. But on the other hand, if we have a more chronic ulcer or one that was previously treated with antibiotic therapy, we want to think about things like Staph aureus, beta hemolytic strep, and even the anterior bacteriaceae. What about an ulcer that's macerated because of soaking? There we want to talk about uh, Pseudomonas. Or how about a malodorous foot? There we want to think about a mixed infection. Long duration uh, non-healing wounds, especially those that have been previously treated with multiple antibiotic regimens, that's where we talk about our more resistant infections. So we always want to categorize the patient in terms of what they're most likely to um, be infected with. What are some early clues of infection in the diabetic foot? Think about uh, drainage, for example. How about erythema that's unexplainable? The presence of a foul odor can Im imply a necrotic infection. And then also things like tissue necrosis, gangrene, a um, unexplainable leukocytosis, and we always want to look at the inflammatory markers. But the truth of the matter is you need to use multiple clues for these patients because a lot of times their infection can be subtle. Um, when osteomyelitis occurs, it may often be an immediate precursor to amputation. Um, most cases are the direct extension of a local ulcer to underlying bone. Um, but uh, infection can be clinically difficult to detect and we always have to consider where the ulcer is, where the osteomyelitis is, what the patient's vascular status is, the extent of the soft tissue and bony destruction, the patient's systemic illness, and also their preferences. I always ask a patient, what do you want to do with this diabetic ulcer? Because some patients say, I want to preserve my digits at all cost, and others say, do whatever you need to do to cure this infection in the most practical manner. What are some diagnostic modalities for the treatment of diabetic foot osteo? Um, well, for many of us, we intuitively recognize that the presence of exposed bone is one of the most significant clinical indicators of likely underlying osteomyelitis that we have available. Plain x-rays can be helpful, but a lot of times initial single x-rays are less sensitive and multiple x-rays may be helpful. MRI, I think, has uh, emerged as the modal diagnostic modality of choice in patients. In past years, we used a lot of nuclear modalities like the three-phase bone scan and TAG WBC scans. I think those now have some utility, but in more selective cases. Most people have not utilized ultrasonography, however. Well, um, this study by DIN in 2008 was a meta-analysis of uh, the diagnostic accuracy of physical examination and imaging tests for osteomyelitis. And what did they find? 
Well, actually, the test with the highest odds ratio was ex the exposed bone probe to bone test. This was uh, uh, Grayson's landmark study in the new, in, uh, uh, I think it was actually in JAMA in 1995, which um, uh, is a great tool that all of us can use and is kind of a rapid diagnostic technique for diagnosing osteomyelitis. But beyond that, the MRI really had the highest odds ratio, followed by the TAG WBC scan, and then uh, the bone scan and the plain radiograph. So think about this when you're uh, thinking about a modality for diagnosing diabetic foot osteo. Now, what are the general principles of treatment for diabetic foot osteomyelitis? Well, you really think about them in terms of a triad, right? Surgical intervention, restoration of circulation if it's impaired, and antimicrobial therapy, where we come in, the infectious disease uh, specialist arena. And when I talk about surgical options, we want to distinguish resection, which can potentially be curative, and debridement, which um, involves the sort of the piecemeal uh, whittling away of the bone, so we re remove all non-viable bone, and that is followed by usually extended antibiotic therapy. What are some different types of debridement? Well, the most practical and the most useful debridement is surgical debridement, right? Sharp surgical debridement is obviously preferred. But when that's not possible, we talk about mechanical debridement, and that's maybe less intuitive to us, but when you put a, um, a wet-to-dry gauze on a wound, that's mechanical debridement because those gauze fibers, when the, when the uh, dressing dries, and you remove the dressing or pulling away that detritus and non-viable tissue. And so that's the concept of mechanical debridement. In pre-years um, pre where us uh, old-timer infectious disease uh, practitioners practiced, uh, particularly Dr. Tony, no, I'm just, I'm picking <laughs> on, I kid, Dr. Tony, I kid. Um, we used to use whirlpool therapy. We don't use that as much anymore. Um, also, uh, irrigation and lavage is sometimes used. Um, enzymatic debriders like collagenase or panophil are sometimes used. And uh, another concept is called autolytic debridement. That's when we use like hydrocolloid dressings, those dressings that apply moisture to a dry wound. And those can kind of liquefy the slough and allow it to be removed um, in the cleansing process. Um, what are some essentials for, for antibiotic management for diabetic foot infections? Empiric therapy, of course, should cover MRSA and Pseudomonas because these are common organisms in diabetic foot wounds. Um, specific therapy should be based on invasive cultures and biopsies. And we have to give antibiotics in conjunction with surgical debridement if it's indicated. So I'm just going to briefly cover some concepts here for diabetic foot therapy for infections, right? So these are kind of our intuitive go-to agents for diabetic foot infections infections, particularly for empiric therapy. Um, some are sort of higher index benefit, lower um, adverse risk than others. Some are more appropriate in drug-resistant infections, and some are more appropriate in first-line infections, right? Intuitively, we would probably go to the zosins first or the third or fourth generation cephalosporins first, and the carbapenems and the aminoglycosides last. But we use our infectious disease knowledge base and our experience to decide between those options. Gram-positive coverage options for MRSA, we think about drugs like vancomycin as maybe more first line, uh, and daptomycin perhaps, minocycline are options. We think about ceftaroline as a, more of a newer therapeutic option since maybe the last diabetic foot guidelines were released, and other drugs like uh, uh, potentially Dalbavance and Linezolid as more later generation options. Now, how long do we treat diabetic foot infections? This is from uh, the uh, 2012 guidelines. Let's uh, divide these out by um, soft tissue only and bone only, right? So if we have a mild soft tissue infection, topical, even topical therapy may be beneficial. This is an outpatient treated disease. We may treat for one to two weeks, extend up to four weeks if slow to resolve. 
If we have a severe soft tissue infection, then we're gonna use longer therapy, typically parenteral initially and then switch to oral. What if we have osteomyelitis? If somebody is post-amputation and we're sure that we have clean margins, the guidelines suggest only a short course of therapy may be needed afterwards. Um, but if we have residual infected soft tissue but not bone, longer therapy up to three weeks. If we have a patient who's received debridement but not resection and has been diagnosed with osteomyelitis, then obviously a four to six week course of therapy is recommended. If we have a patient that has uh, residual dead bone postoperatively who, or who did not have surgery or who has chronic osteomyelitis, those patients may need prolonged therapy. And that therapy may extend even to a case where we're treating them indefinitely as in the context of chronic oral suppression. And some of our patients require that, especially for chronic osteo that recurs. This is the worst diabetic foot I was able to find on the internet. Um, I think all of us would do one of these, a face palm, if we saw this patient and, 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 uh, and say, how do we treat this? This is uh, the worst case scenario. Um, but remember, we're part of a team, right? We don't, we're not alone. So the treatment of wounds has gone back to ancient times. Um, again, uh, um, some of our practitioners in the room may have used uh, some of the older modalities, <laughs> myself included. I, I began my career using cow urine and boiling oil. And now in the modern times, um, some of these actually make sense <laughs> like, uh, like zinc oxide, I mean, I think we would all argue that uh, that may work. And even honey is a modern modality. So what are the initial principles of diabetic ulcer management? We want to debride all non-viable tissue, rule out infection, and uh, use antibiotics uh, um, if, they're need, if they need to be used. Ensure adequate circulation and optimize wood environment for healing. So modern diabetic foot dressings include conventional and advanced dressings. For conventional dressings, we think about two by two or four by four uh, dry gauze, packing strips. I've tried to include a brand name for each of these so we can kind of associate them with what we, our knowledge base. Like we may um, all have heard of Duoderm, but we may not associate that with hydrocolloid dressings or Tegaderm as being a thin film or even alginates like Curazorb or silver impregnated dressings like Aquacel. This is from the International Best Practice Guidelines, but basically the category of wound dressings are, West, are dressings used for um, moist or soupy wounds, dressings for dry wounds, and dressings for infected wounds. So if you're thinking about um, wounds that are excessively moist, you might use an alginate, for example. You might use a foam. If you're thinking about wounds that are ex excessively dry, then you may, may want to rehydrate the wounds. Think about hydrogels or even uh, other uh, ointments or preparations like honey. Um, if you're thinking about wounds that are infected and you need antimicrobial action, think about iodine, PHMB, um, which stands for uh, polyhexylmethyl biguanide. It's an, an antiseptic agent. And even silver. We see a lot of our patients with silver impregnated dressings. So is my wound excessively moist or macerated? You want to dry it, right? Is my wound excessively dry? You want to give it some wound, rehydrate it so that the tissue can heal. Or is my wound infected? Then you want to use an antiseptic or antimicrobial dressing. Why do some wounds not heal? Um, are we wrong about our, infect, our, our infection? Was a, a proper tissue specimen obtained? Um, is our antibiotic regimen sufficiently broad? Was surgical debridement adequate? Has the patient's metabolic status and diabetes been optimized? And do they have vascular issues? Those are the things we all want to think about when our diabetic foot wound is not healing. These are some adjunctive therapies, um, include things like autologous or recombinant growth factors, hyperbarics, negative pressure wound therapy. 
We'll talk more about those in, in particular, those uh, second two, and some others that are listed. So hyperbaric oxygen is kind of uh, um, one of those adjunctive treatments we all hear about. And it's said to enhance healing through increased tissue oxygen tension, neovascularization, and antimicrobial effects. Um, it's shown case-specific benefit in select cases, but unfortunately its expense and limited availability kind of limit its use. I always like to say that I've treated many diabetic foot wounds without it. So if you have it available and you have a patient um, where it could offer some benefit, it's worth a try, but it is not an essential modality. Um, and it is ineffective in severe vascular deficient insufficiency. And remember, the benefit of hyperbaric oxygen is not the direct effect in the chamber. It's the increased partial pressure of oxygen which the patient inhales. So this is a vascular benefit. So if you have somebody with ischemia, as I said before, um, that increased oxygen tension is not going to get to the tissues in a topical basis. We all know this modality, the wound vac, vacuum assisted closure. This benefits uh, the diabetic wound by basically applying negative pressure to the wound, mechanically drawing the wound closed, and also uh, simultaneously um, removing infected tissue material and tissue fluids from the wound bed. It's a very effective modality. We see it here all the time. What are some uh, post-treatment considerations? So you've got the wound to heal. What do you need to do afterwards to prevent the wound from breaking down again? or preventing more diabetic foot uh, wounds to occur. Well, patients need to be aware of ways that they can prevent recurrent or new ulcers. For example, they may modify their gait, uh, taking shorter steps, and decreasing unnecessary ambulation may decrease the risk of re-ulceration. Patients who spend much of their work time sitting or, uh, excuse me, standing or walking, let's say they're a restaurant worker or they're a mailman and they have diabetic feet, it's possible they may need to find alternative employment or be reassigned. Um, therapeutic shoes are very important and we need to instruct them to inspect their feet daily. Um, patients who do much of their exercise um, involving walking can find alternative means of exercise because exercise is extremely important for these patients. But if you walk for your exercise, maybe it's better that you swim do rowing exercises, work out in the gym, try to offload the feet, consider other uh, exercise activities. And um, uh, most importantly, uh, patients need to be educated on how to prevent ulceration. So we can tell them to wash and dry their feet daily, avoid hot water, dry thoroughly between their toes, debride calluses, uh, don't self-cut their nails if they have neuropathy. These are all common uh, sense concepts. Avoid temperature extremes, um, inspect shoes for foreign objects. I remember I had a patient, maybe some of you um, have too, who played uh, two rounds of golf, came home, and what was in their shoe? Like the pin, where you put the golf ball in? Golf ball. Oh, a real golf ball? Yes, oh, actual golf ball in the shoe, and they didn't know it. That's gonna, that's gonna cause some problems, trust me. They actually had a golf ball in their shoe. They had a hole in, a hole in one hand in the shoe. Yeah. So now these are some basic footwear education uh, things to consider. Again, avoid those pointy-toed shoes. Wear diabetic footwear. And these are some educational resources that um, uh, we can consider for our patients. There's a booklet, and here's the URL. Take care of your feet for a lifetime. We can give patients. You can print it out uh, when you're in your clinic. Um, and for clinicians, there's several reference sources. I've listed the diabetic foot infection guidelines published in CID in 2012. And there's an international working group for the diabetic foot that publishes a nice document called IGW, I IWGDF on the diagnosis and management of foot infections in persons with diabetes. Check that out. If you want to take a picture of that, you're welcome to. And um, also, this will be online. Um, and I want to invoke uh, Ella Fitzgerald, the first lady of song again, when she said, it isn't where you came from, honey, it's where you're going that counts. <laughs>
So think about this as you move forward with your assessment of diabetic foot patients.